I, I'm, I'm interested in learning, so I'm going to talk a little bit about learning this morning. Um, TED and TED Talks are all about uh, sharing ideas. Uh, I'm going to share some ideas that aren't my ideas at all. So the, the ideas that I've borrowed have been developed by cognitive psychologists over the last uh, 100 years or so, and are all over the uh, peer-reviewed literature. Uh, fortunately, or perhaps... Uh, Unfortunately, I haven't read all of them, uh, but th there are uh, a number of works of popular literature that gather together some of this research and present those ideas for us. So I'm going to borrow from these four books at least, uh, but I'm also very fortunate in that I have uh, many colleagues who are always willing to talk about teaching and learning, um, and uh, some of the ideas I'm going to talk about this morning I've actually discussed at length with, uh, with Dawn McIsaac, with Magdalene Normando, uh, and with Kathy Wilson, who uh, are all involved in teaching and learning at UMB. Um, so, learning is a, is a journey, it's an odyssey, um, and I'm going to try and argue this morning that uh, learning is a journey into the unknown, and only when we journey into the unknown can we really get the best possible learning. Uh, oh, good. So the phrase, unknown unknowns, uh, is associated most closely with Donald Rumsfeld, uh, but it actually predates him by about 50 years. Uh, he's... Uh, borrowing from a self-awareness two-by-two matrix, that's good. Uh, he's borrowing from a self-awareness two-by-two matrix uh, that was invented by Jonathan Luft and Harrington Ingham in the 50s, uh, the Johari window, uh, and this is a way of analyzing one's awareness of oneself. And I'm gonna steal it completely and adapt it for analyzing one's awareness of one's learning. Uh, and we'll see if we can make that work. The, the Johari window uh, has four areas. The top left is things you know about yourself and things other people know about you as well. That's the arena. Um, bottom left, things you know about yourself that other people don't know. A facade. Top right, things that you know about yourself, or rather you don't know about yourself that other people do. That's a blind spot. And then bottom right, and I'm going to argue that in, in the realm of learning, this is where all the good stuff takes place. This is how we get to learn things best and deepest. Unknown unknowns. Um, things that are completely, or seem at first blush, completely unfamiliar. To put this in a, in a learning and a teaching context, uh, the, the bottom left, the, the facade, f for people who are laughingly known as experts um, and work at universities, our job is supposedly to convey things that we know to, th to people who are interested in learning the things that we know. Um, and that's actually uh, a... a deadly place to be in terms of the classroom. That's the expert blind spot. It's, far, it's very difficult to be sufficiently self-aware that you understand um, your, the extent of your knowing, the extent of your learning, and then make yourself able to communicate that knowledge in a way that is understandable to somebody who hasn't come across it before. It's very easy to fall into this trap, the expert blind spot, uh, and be unable to explain how you came to be at the point you're at. Uh, so, being aware of one's own learning, um, something we're going to come back to a little bit later, knowing about one's knowing is called metacognition, and it turns out to be very difficult just because of the way the human brain is wired. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so, to put this in a sort of uh, a university classroom kind of a context, the, let's imagine that we're at a time of year where there have been a lot of tests and maybe some exams. Um, the, the, the top left quadrant is the, the things that we're most familiar with. Those are all the things that you've seen in class. So you come into a test and you look at a question and you go, oh yeah, got this. Top right quadrant, um, that's stuff that other people seem to know that you don't seem to know when you walk into a test. That happens, but hopefully there's a bottom left bit as well. There's some stuff that you know that other people don't know. Down on the bottom right, this thing that I'm going to argue is the most important part of learning, uh, the unknown unknowns, is something that's completely new. And you're being asked to bring your learning, your new knowledge, into an area that seems totally unfamiliar. And in a test or an exam, that seems grossly unfair. <laughs> and, and, and is frequently a cause of much dissent. But there's, there's a reason. There's a reason why that question is on there. There's a reason because this is the realm in education theory of what we like to call transfer. So this is the realm where you're being asked to bring new skills and new knowledge to something completely new. Um, and only by doing that can you really test your understanding. Only by doing that can you really develop your models of how the universe works. Uh, th this whole idea that you can get to that quadrant 
is a progression from novice to expert. Uh, and quite a lot of university education is supposed to bring us from novice to expert. Or that I, might, I might argue that this is really a, a lifetime journey, going from unconscious incompetence to uh, conscious incompetence, being aware that there's stuff we don't know, going from conscious incompetence to conscious competence. This is where you can do something, or you've learned some new things, there we go. We've learned some new things, but you really have to concentrate very hard to do them. You have to concentrate very hard to make use of your new knowledge. Now, the expert realm at the far right-hand side of this journey is unconscious competence. And here, you have such a well-developed mental model of your subject material that you can almost do it without thinking about it too carefully. And at that point, you're equipped to begin to add new knowledge to the realm. You're, begin to, you're, you're equipped to be able to contribute to the, to the knowledge base of whatever subject it is that you're interested in. The, this whole journey um, from unconscious incompetence up to unconscious competence, from novice to expert, requires that you hop around the four-quadrant model. It requires that you journey from one of these rooms in what's sometimes called the Jahari house to the other rooms all the time. Um, so the whole idea of becoming an uh, expert is a jump from the known knowns to the known unknowns to the unknown unknowns. Preferably, by going down to the bottom right-hand corner, you can test your understanding. Um, the, the, when you wind up in this bottom right-hand corner, when you are expert, what you've built for yourself are, are solutions to unknown problems. You can generate solutions to unknown problems. And, and you've got a robust mental model of the particular aspect of how the world works. Mental models are collections of memories and expertise and skills that you can draw on all as a body. And they take a long time to develop. So this journey, this odyssey from novice to expert, actually requires that you navigate a little bit. You, c you can't make that journey without being aware of where you are, um, both on the sort of unconscious incompetence to expert axis and in the Jahari house, and in the windows of the Jahari house, in the, in the rooms of the Jahari house. And being aware of your learning, understanding what your understanding is, is called metacognition. It turns out to be extremely difficult. Because the human brain is wired to give you a misleading impression of what you know. The human brain actually likes you to believe that you understand more than you actually do. There we go. Um, so here are just a, a few examples of ways in which the brain can trick you into believing your understanding is greater than it is. And I'll talk about, about three of them. Hindsight bias. Um, so in, in physics, we would often test people's understanding of new physics areas with a question, maybe, and an answer. If, if you have a question and an answer side by side, hindsight bias makes your brain believe that you always knew the answer. So then when you're presented with the question without the answer, the brain goes, oh, wait a second, where did that go? I always knew that answer, it's gone. Foresight, foresight bias is the kind of opposite of that. So in foresight bias, when you're presented with a question and an answer together, you believe that you will always know the answer. And weirdly, when you're then presented with a question without the answer, or perhaps the question and five possible answers, you don't actually remember what the answer was at all. But when you see them together, foresight bias makes you think that you will always know the answer. The illusion of fluency is a deceptive little beast. The illusion of fluency, if you are presented with a particular clear, say, presentation, or a particular clear reading about a topic, the fact that that is clear will make you believe that you understand it completely. Um, you've probably all been in the kind of talk where some expert stands up and goes, and you can follow every single point in the talk, nodding the whole time. And when you leave, you go, and that was a great talk about the illusion of fluency. Just because it was clear makes you think that you've got it all down. Um, so the brain, in, in addition to all these, there are, there are more cognitive psychology traps the brain falls into that make us believe that we understand more than we do. It makes metacognition, the knowing about our knowing, very difficult. So um, that can lead us into, into weird and unsatisfactory study habits, for instance. This is a, a table from a paper by John Donosky and colleagues about study habits that have been successful and unsuccessful. And he's gathered together all kinds of studies. Uh, look at the things that don't work. 
um, summarizing, highlighting, uh, mnemonics, uh, imagery used for text learning. These have all been demonstrated in studies not to be terribly useful study habits. The things that do work, practice testing, basically. If you step into the unknown unknowns room of the Jahari house, you can actually test your knowledge against a new situation. You can test your mental model against something that's completely unrecognizable. And only in those circumstances do you really improve your learning. Every time you access the mental model, you can build on it. And by distributing the practice and interleaving the practice, so practicing subject A and B and C one after the other, or spreading the practice out, you can improve that learning. The our metacognition is an important navigation tool to improve our understanding. I'm going to give you an example, just very briefly. Um, these are the phases of the moon. So this is something that's very familiar. You've probably seen the moon many times go from crescent to full and back to crescent again. So without calling out, just in your seats for a moment, think to yourself, in this very familiar situation, how good is my knowledge? So do you know how long that takes? Don't call out. Just think about it. Well, perhaps you do know how long that takes. If you know how long that takes, here's a slightly more difficult question. Does the phases of the moon go from top left to bottom right, or bottom right to top left? A very familiar thing. Probably you don't know the answer to that question. Probably in a group this size. Here's even harder. Just turn to the person next to you, and between the two of you, in 15 seconds, see if you can come up with an explanation of how the phases of the moon work. Go. <laughs> That's enough. That's enough. The, the point is, of course, that even though the phases of the moon, shh, shh, focus. The point, we don't really care here about the phases of the moon. The point is, though, that the phases of the moon, although they're very familiar, are something that is very difficult to explain in completeness. It's very difficult to be aware of what your understanding of the phases of the moon actually are. So, learning is a journey. Uh, it's very important on that journey um, that you venture into the unknown. The only way you can really test whether you understand something is by putting yourself in a new situation. For instance, explain to the person next to you how the phases of the moon work. The only way that you can test your understanding and your mental models is to put yourself in a new situation and try out your mental models against that new situation. Uh, and the only way you can really make progress along this journey, along this axis of learning, is to be very aware of what it is that you know. And so unfair. The brain likes to trick you into thinking that you know more than you know. Thank you. Okay.